A mega tsunami is a truly terrifying event. Thankfully, they're quite rare. It takes certain specific conditions to generate them. But in general, the predominant ways that they will be created is following a landslide, meteorite strike, man-made explosive detonation, or large-scale caldera forming volcanic eruptions that occur near to or directly impact a large body of water. I might be missing a few other ways, but you get the idea. Massive splashes, basically. Something like this occurred in Latuya Bay, which is located in Alaska in 1958, when a gigantic 524 meter or 1719 foot high mega tsunami was created after a magnitude 8 earthquake dislodged a massive amount of rock on the side of a cliff face, which fell directly into the bay below, spawning a tsunami that was truly the stuff of nightmares. So in Australia, we have widespread evidence of a truly cataclysmic impact event that happened fairly recently, and an associated mega tsunami which inundated almost all parts of the western and southern coastlines of Australia. A large comet slammed into the deep waters of the Indian Ocean, and it's thought this comet fractured into three pieces, two of which were much smaller and appear to have landed in different spots in the Pacific Ocean, making this a global event. And the reason we know this is because the rainout from these impact centers overlaps with the ones in the Indian Ocean, as this event also caused a worldwide deluge that lasted for weeks on end, as it vaporized an incredible amount of seawater, which upon impact was converted into an immeasurable amount of water vapor that would then go on to travel with the prevailing winds around the globe, taking several days after this event to finally cool down based on studies and the link to this study will be located in the description below. But after this water vapor finally cooled down, it would finally be rained back down to earth in a truly biblical proportion kind of rainstorm. And biblical proportion might just be the best way to describe it, as this rainstorm coincides with the flood stories that were told globally by over 150 different cultures. This comet was a shoemaker levy type of impact. The comet shoemaker levy 9 broke apart in July of 1992 and it collided with Jupiter in July of 1994, providing the first direct observation of an extraterrestrial collision of solar system objects. This generated a large amount of coverage in the popular media, and the comet was closely observed by astronomers worldwide. So the collision that occurred in the Indian Ocean was caused by a comet similar to the one that slammed into Jupiter. It's a comet, not an asteroid. The difference is an asteroid is made up solely of rock, whereas comets are a mixture of rock, ice, and gas. If this was an asteroid, the impact would have been far, far worse, especially if it was a heavy iron-rich asteroid. The mega tsunami would have probably been at least one kilometer high if that occurred. The capital city of Western Australia is Perth, and as of today, it has close to two million people living in this city. It's one of the many places that were built atop the remains of the deep sea sediments that were dredged up and carried over here by the mega tsunami following the collision, which by the way left a 30 kilometer wide crater after the comet had struck. But when it collided with the bedrock of the Indian Ocean, sand, mud, volcanic material and whatever else existed on the almost 4 kilometer or 2.5 mile deep section of the Indian Ocean where this comet struck, got blown out in all directions. A large part of it was thrown into space as well, but the majority of it would be carried by the mega tsunami that was generated, only to be dumped here en masse 5,000 years ago following this event, changing the entire landscape literally in the blink of an eye by converting the previously flat land into a landscape dominated by sandy hills that were comprised of deep sea fossils, mud, and obviously, sand. Core samples taken from these sediments feature deep sea microfossils that are fused to extraterrestrial metals. And these metals could have only come from this type of event. So in this video, we're going to nerd out on the geography of Perth as it pertains to the sediment left over by the mega tsunami that now dominates the surface layer and the expression of the land for many tens of kilometers. A really massive area of land was affected by this tidal wave of truly epic proportions. It swept inland for many kilometers, and it would have been a truly terrifying event to have witnessed. And if you're unlucky enough to be in the immediate strike zone, the chances of surviving this type of event are next to none. The evidence that we have of it are in the form of the arrow-shaped depositions that are left behind following the retreat of the mega tsunami, known as chevrons. These chevrons are actually how we found the impact crater to begin with, by studying which directions they went and tracing them back to their source. 
after which deep sea seismic imaging was conducted in the vicinity where scientists thought it may be by ship until the crater was finally found. The cool thing about literally every single town that's built along the coast in Western Australia is that they are all built within these chevrons, blending mankind with the remains of a landscape forged by a truly destructive event, which deposited sediments at a vast scale across the coastlines of Australia. And you can clearly see the effects of it from Western Australia all the way to Tasmania. And I'll cover this in depth in my next episode. And there are some truly spectacular features up and down the entire western and southern seaboard. And on the eastern seaboard, there are some unrelated mega tsunami chevrons. So the waves would have absolutely inundated this area when the tsunami first struck, with a very conservative minimum height of 150 meters or 492 feet being attributed to it. Most studies think it was around 180 meters or 590 feet when it reached the shorelines of Western and Southwestern Australia, and that sounds about right. This wave went as far inland as 30 kilometers, and in some areas, it went further than this. And the force of the initial impact when the massive wall of water struck everything would have been unimaginable. In some areas, entire cliff faces have been severely eroded to a dramatic extent by this single event. And in the northern parts of Western Australia, scars exist across large areas of the arid land, which have recorded this event better than anything else because of the climate. And whilst we will be covering this in the next episode, here are some pictures of the scars left in the land as a teaser. You can clearly see the direction they were traveling. So if this event happened today, the entire city of Perth would be drowned and destroyed faster than most could imagine. And the wave would travel over the entire city stretching all the way up to the limits of it, waning in its power most at the beginnings of the ancient cliff face that is comprised of over 2.5 billion year old rocks from the Archean Eon. These cliff faces start about 30 kilometers in, and it more or less broke the wave and stopped it from going too far inland. So if I was to quickly throw over a geological map of this area and take a guess at which layer this tsunami deposit is, I'd say it's either been broken up into two, so it's either both or one or the other in my opinion, but in the description for both the Yogenup Formation and the Bassendean Sand Layers, make mention of dune quartz sands and heavy mineral concentrations existing pointing to these two as being the layers. And that would make sense because they are slowly being overlain by the more recently deposited sediments of the Guildford Formation layer, which is the most recent alluvial sediment. Now check this out, this is literally the entire extent of the wave in the grand scheme of things. Look how clear the difference is between the mega tsunami sediment strewn land and the cliff face all along the west coast. This is a rough limit of the mega tsunami. Water did move past here as based on topographical data, these cliffs are between 124 all the way up to 331 meters or 406 to 1085 feet in height with it rapidly changing in topography between the drastic dips in elevation that you see. So we can see some chevrons that have moved past this point, but it's unlikely it really went too far beyond this peak over here. So interestingly and rather unsurprisingly, Perth's topography acted like a beautiful little funnel for this event, which would have contributed to the height of the mega tsunami as it began to ramp up and narrow as it entered through the funnel meaning the waves more than likely would have reached their highest here due to the funnel-like topography of the area. So it's actually possible that I'm wrong and that the wave was way, way higher and went way, way further. And there are chevron-like shapes that do go inland for many kilometers beyond this point, but I don't know for sure if they are chevrons or just chevron-like shapes from past tectonic events, with geological maps not really helping. I'd actually have to go here in person and take a look for myself or have someone to do it for me. So in general, Perth is about 30 meters above sea level. If a wave at a very conservative estimate of 150 meters hit this area, well, you can do the math. That's 120 meters or 393 feet worth of water covering you in an instant, smashing you at a bone crushing pace when it makes contact, thrusting you into a watery chaos of pressure induced insanity, taking you along with it for a very violent, tumultuous and bumpy ride and death. Poor animals, man, dead set. This would have taken so many animals along with it and it would have more than likely impacted many indigenous communities too. What an intense and scary event. I'd love to know if any stories of it exist within the local tribes. 
In Perth today, you can really see the chevrons in the actual city itself. Here's a few over here near Allen Park. The chevrons are really significant on the edge of the beach. And here are some houses that are built into the actual chevron. And look how white these freshly exposed sediments are in these new industrial complexes. This is all deep sea sediment from the 12,500 foot or 3,810 meter deep sea floor of the Indian Ocean where the comet struck. Here we have what appears to be a slide of fine sediment which was thrown across the land rather spectacularly. I'm assuming this happened because it is the lowest topographical point in the area, where the most significant amount of sediment slid tens of kilometers inland. You can see the layers where it was deposited the most. This is Bold Park. It contains the chevron shapes that once would have existed everywhere on this land before it was largely leveled to build a city. So because of this leveling, you might think things don't appear to be that bad. Until we get to this point, where habitation and the alteration of terrain hasn't yet commenced on a grand scale, and we begin to see the size and extent of the chevrons that buried this entire area. On the topography, some of these chevrons are between 40 and 90 meters, or 131 and 252 feet in height. Towns are built around them in the lower lying areas. The arrow shape is ever so present everywhere here to a grand scale. This is the type of stuff that Google Maps or Google Earth would have a hard time conveying, and this is where this simulation shines. So these events are truly destructive, as we will learn in the coming episodes where we cover not only the mega tsunami damage but the deluge that followed. Let's pray that we are on top of any potential impact event that could create another scenario like this one that occurred 5,000 years ago that our ancestors across the globe somehow survived through with much difficulty. And I suppose we should thank those guys and gals who did. It's because of their sheer tenacity and utter willpower to survive that all of us are here today. So this is the violent story of how the land that Perth sits atop was constructed. A once flat land suddenly made mountainous after being buried by a huge tidal wave, more than likely stretching far beyond the conservative 180 meter tall mark due to the aforementioned funnel here. In fact, I've tracked what appears to be chevron-like structures up to 100 kilometers inland in some very flat places. One day, I'll go there in person to check them out, but the entire land here was dramatically altered after the waves finally receded. The death toll inflicted on life here must have been truly depressing to see, being surrounded by nothing but death in a place that was once home, but that now looks like an alien landscape dotted with weird muddy sandy hills that are scattered everywhere and that are filled with alien metals fused to deep sea fossils. This was a sad day, but unfortunately it was just the beginning, because the rainstorms that would follow in the coming days are what would really turn this horrible situation way worse, and the death toll to both humans and animals are about to notch up from regional disturbances to one that affects life planet wide as a result of this. When a comet collided with a deep section of the Indian Ocean around 5,000 years ago, the mega tsunami that was generated absolutely inundated and decimated the shorelines of every continent that was within the direct reach of the impact crater. From Africa to the Middle East, to India, Asia and Australia, every continent bears the marks from this event, either in the form of deep gashes carved into the bedrock of the land that stretches for kilometers, or in the massive arrow-like hills that are left behind following these types of massive mega tsunami type of events, known as chevrons. Some places bear the marks more than others, with more clear and easier to see visual evidence occurring in places that are more arid and that contain little vegetation, such as here in Western Australia, and in places in northeastern Africa, like here in Somalia, where we can see the deep carvings in the land that were etched with force by the severe erosive action unleashed by the unfathomably tall tidal wave that slammed into here at one point in time in history. In our last episode, we discussed the damage and present day evidence of this mega tsunami that exists within Perth, the capital city of Western Australia, which was absolutely hammered when this mega tsunami made contact with this area and was especially affected as a result of its funnel like topography, which would have increased the ramp up height of the mega tsunami as it made contact with the land. 
I discussed the evidence, including what physical changes to the land this mega tsunami event left behind, and I teach you what they look like and what to look for in that episode, and it's best to watch it before this one as a result of that. The link to it will be both in the description down below or on the top right of the screen. In this episode, we'll discuss the damage that was inflicted to Victoria, Tasmania, and the islands between the two, of which some incredible destruction was wrought on the coastline of pretty much all of these places. I was originally going to do the rest of Australia all in one video until I realised that damage from this mega tsunami was so widespread it turned into a 30 or 40 minute video, so instead I've decided to break it up into two. This episode will focus on Tasmania, Victoria, and the islands between, and the next episode will cover South Australia and the significant damage found in the northern parts of Western Australia, as well as what occurred in the south. The damage inflicted to Australia was widespread following this event. There were very little places that were spared, with only a few sheltered locations existing in a few areas here and there, such as this one in Western Australia just south of Perth, which was sheltered from the direct impact of the mega tsunami wave by this piece of land here, that jutted out and served as a shield, taking the main impact of the wave instead. Vegetation is lush here, so it's harder to see, but the tsunami left really deep gashes. This area is topographically high too. This part is literally around 150 meters, and look, the wave flew right over it. That's how high this freaking wave was. Scientists believe it was around 180 meters in height. In South Australia and Victoria, the entire land was smashed, including the islands between Victoria and Tasmania, such as King Island, which has several places that were severely impacted by the initial wave. And many of these places include large chevron depositions, such as this obscure little location here, on this tiny little island in the northwestern part of Tasmania, along with many depositions in the lower lying areas of the western coast of Tasmania. So let's start at Tassie and work our way up, documenting the evidence that can be found on the coastlines of every place we see. Our evidence of the mega tsunami strike begins here in the southernmost section of the west coast of Tasmania. This is a very interesting spot because only one area exists that has very clear and distinct chevrons and directional wave damage, with a second lesser affected spot that only hints to what occurred. The rest of this part of Tasmania doesn't have a single bit of evidence. Why? Because these islands blocked it. Look at the evidence on them instead. It's clear that Matsuka Island bore the very main brunt of the wave impact here, as the entire island is dominated by chevrons, and it was heavily altered following this event as a result of this. The waves hit here and here, and this is the second less obvious spot, a very high cliff face, that shows the erosive visual pattern of a very large wave impact and retreat, along with the aforementioned spot here, with clear chevron deposits. So moving on to the western coast of Tasmania, and here, even on Google Maps or Google Earth, you can see the areas affected by the mega tsunami by just looking at the directional strips of bare sand that exist. This to me is a telltale sign that I've seen time and time again all across Australia and even the world. These little sandy strips that just kind of pop out, and they're always in the direction that the wave would have travelled from when the comet impacted the Indian Ocean. And when you don't see them, it's because they've been blocked by some kind of island or obstruction that bore the brunt of the direct impact instead, such as what happened in this area here. The clear evidence that we have of the mega tsunami hitting this region is of this deep sediment dump over here. Notice the direction of it. The wave hit from this angle, so there's parts where sediment was deposited in such a vast amount that vegetation still hasn't regrown on all of the chevrons deposited here, with other parts of it being dominated by plant growth. Now check out what this wave has done to the surrounding mountains here. It stripped them bare, and carved into them in a directional manner, leaving these deep scathing tears in the land, which were engraved as a direct result of the force of the impact and the subsequent water movement following it. The major erosive forces altered both the land and the bedrock immensely after this event occurred, as it literally tore into these mountains and sculpted them in a near instant. 
you can see how they differ from the more natural erosion channels that the other mountains here have, such as these ones over here. This area bore the direct brunt of the wave, and look how deeply incised it has become as a direct result of that. Now this is just speculation, but it's a pretty solid theory in my eyes at least. Based on the scarring of the land, it appears the wave hit from this angle, hopped over this lower part of the mountain range and followed it all the way through to the other side, leaving behind these massive cuts in the mountain that normally wouldn't be there without this kind of event happening. Also a theory, but at Tasmania's most southern point over here, we have these deep gnashes dug into the bedrock here, which are also facing the same direction that the mega tsunami wave travelled, and whilst their existence might not be attributed to it directly, I'd be willing to bet a part of my manhood that a significant amount of the present day look of it and the erosive direction are directly related to this mega tsunami impacting it, and significantly eroding it as this entire stretch of land has dozens of west to east oriented tears in the land created by the erosive action of the mega tsunami waves as it travelled over it. It probably completely stripped the sides of these places bare of the topsoil that once existed here and held this place together, significantly changing it in an instant. So as we move north, we can see the same directional chevron depositions and carving of the rugged mountains that dominate the western stretches of the beautiful ancient land of Tasmania, which is around 1.5 billion years old by the way, making it a billion years older than Victoria, New South Wales and almost all of Queensland. These chevrons mainly got deposited in the lower lying areas, and as we move on to the northern tip of Tasmania, we see a rather large fan shape in which a vast amount of chevron accumulations were deposited after the massive 180 odd metre high wave ripped through here. As we move north from Tasmania, here at Trefoil Island, you'd think these massive 80 metre or 260 foot high cliff faces would be enough to kind of shelter it, but nope. Check out these deep gnashes that exist. So we know the wave was at least 80 metres high when it reached here, but based on this evidence it was much, much higher. Obviously it was still around the 180 metre high mark when it hit this part of Australia. This is Hunter Island. It's a pretty big island in northwestern Tasmania and it was absolutely smashed by this mega tsunami. Check out the massive wave damage that's still clearly visible. You can see this on Google Earth too and you can see it very easily. This is because the island's highest peaks are the two bumps on the eastern and western side, and these bumps are between 70 and 58 metres high, so it's safe to say this entire island was submerged for a while when this tsunami strike occurred. On Three Hummock Island, we can see that not as much damage has occurred in the southwestern part of it, as a result of Hunter Island bearing the brunt of the main impact, which sheltered these places. But as we move up towards the line where this sheltering no longer occurred, we can see the impact of the main wave very, very clearly. This occurred because the little section of Hunter Island that the wave passed over was only 40 metres or 131 feet high, and it was only a thin strip of land, so it did very little to absorb the force of the main impact, and Three Hummock Island did so as a result of this instead in these parts. At King Island we have some really intense damage, like the south is absolutely smashed and the chevrons are very pronounced. The chevron hills themselves can stretch as tall as 117 metres or 262 feet, meaning this once flat land was converted to a relatively hilly terrain overnight with 17 metre high hills existing en masse all around you all of a sudden, pretty much in an instant. Imagine waking up in the morning if you were such a heavy sleeper that you somehow slept through and survived this event, maybe after taking two Ambien, only to be surrounded by sandy hills, you would definitely think you're tripping out, and that's probably why you shouldn't take Ambien. But as we move north, we see the same level of damage, everywhere. King Island would have been slammed, and I have a sneaking suspicion that the entire upper section of the island here was completely inundated and flooded. I see what appears to be chevrons from this event along with those typical direction orientated scratches that we see everywhere. Now you might think that from here we'd naturally move on to Victoria, like these are the only places that would have been hit, right? Nope. Flinders Island has these scars. The roughly 20 meter or 65 foot high island got inundated from one side to the other. 
At Victoria, evidence begins here at Wilson's Prom. The two tourist spots, known as the Dunes of the Big Drift and the Little Drift, are actually all one big quote unquote drift created by this mega tsunami, and by drift I actually mean chevrons. It hit here very hard, and it passed over from the ocean into the Corner Inlet coastal bay. In the south, we see more evidence in a topographical low here, along with more chevrons. West of this, near Venus Bay, at the Cape Lip Trap Coastal Park, chevrons stretch en masse from the south all the way up to and past Venus Bay. This continues up till around the Kulkunda Surf Beach, where it then stops. At this point, the wave damage doesn't become substantial until we go to Cape Otway, where the evidence starts and continues all along the coastline. The massive limestone cliffs that exist all along the Great Ocean Road broke much of the wave's main impact in most of the areas. With that being said though, the wave still easily scaled these cliff faces and it did sweep inland, but the strength of it was dramatically reduced and it didn't stretch as far inland as it would have had these cliffs not existed here like they do to such a pronounced degree. The lower lying areas, however, weren't as fortunate, and massive scars and chevrons do exist. We have places like here at Air River, where the chevron deposits can still be seen even with the vegetative growth. And check out the wave damage here that stretches inland for 3.5 kilometers. Insane stuff. At Johanna River, near the beach campground, we have another set of chevrons that don't reach quite as far inland, but that can still be seen even using satellite view on Google. As we move along, who knows how many apostles stood before this mega tsunami hit but it was probably a lot more than the eight that are left standing today as these beautiful limestone stacks. The steepness of these cliffs bore the brunt of this wave, and honestly I see very little impact evidence worth discussing aside from a few gnashes in the land here and there. So let's move along to the next place of significance, Warrnambool. Oh man, this place got slammed seriously. It's a topographic low of around 32 meters or 104 feet high, and Geez, the chevrons here are amongst the largest in Victoria. Truly fascinating stuff to see. As we go west, past Port Ferry, the same chevron-like damage begins again at the crags. Continuing along at Cape Bridgewater, we see another series of major tsunami chevron deposits. This area is still recovering from the damage unleashed 5,000 years ago, and the deposition is so pronounced that the vegetation has still not regrown. Look at the clear direction the chevrons are travelling to. That's why we were able to so easily locate the crater from these types of events and the deposition that was left. These chevrons reach up to a ridiculous 40 metres or 131 feet high. In our next episode, things ramp up in intensity. South Australia has some areas where some pretty formidable damage exists. Massive chevron deposits, so tall that the vegetation has never been able to regrow. Evidence of this event increases in intensity before peaking in the northwestern parts of Western Australia, where the most significant evidence of this event can be found. And on top of this, I've made what I think might be the first discovery of what appears to be chevron-like shapes in Indonesia. Researchers have often noted how there doesn't really seem to be any visible damage that exists in India, Sri Lanka, or in Indonesia. And this is true, this wave damage is really evident in Australia and then we see very little evidence again until it picks up suddenly in Pakistan. With only one region existing in India that I think might have evidence of a direct hit. I will explain my theory behind why these places didn't receive a direct impact like the Middle East, Africa, Australia, and as you will soon see, Indonesia maybe did. And it's a very fascinating story. And we'll be hopping from continent to continent ending our series in Africa, after which we'll cover the global deluge that occurred from this event post-impact, before ending it there. So stick around and I hope to see you all there, because some of this damage in Indonesia is so immense, but the forests have completely hidden it. But once you see it, you can't unsee it, and I think it's really going to blow your mind. And I'm hoping to one day go there in person to prove this theory. Thanks for watching. Australia was hit by a devastating 180 metre or 590 foot high mega tsunami sometime around 5,000 years ago. The evidence left behind by this event is widespread and very obvious, and the scattered deposits left by it run across a staggering distance. 
that sees damage from this event popping up in southwestern Tasmania and stretching all the way up to this point in Western Australia. This tidal wave of truly epic proportions was generated by a comet impact that struck into a deep section of the Indian Ocean over here, spawning a giant mega tsunami that barreled forth in all directions. This is episode 3 in the series where we document the visual evidence left behind in present day from this event. In episode 1, we kick the series off with a deep dive into the impact, where we discuss how to identify the features before going on to document the significant damage left behind by this event, upon which the entire city of Perth is built. Then in episode 2, we travelled from the bottommost point of Western Tasmania, up through the islands in the Bass Strait, before heading to Victoria and documenting the evidence that was left there, before ending just before we hit the border with South Australia. In this episode, we'll begin by covering the incredible damage present in South Australia as we slowly journey further west, documenting the destruction that was wrought and the depositions that were lain. And this slowly intensifies as we progress throughout the video and as we go from South Australia through to Western Australia, where we'll then journey all the way up north to finally discover what is by far the most spectacular evidence of this event that has been left behind in the very far north of Western Australia. On top of this, I'll also explain the difference between chevrons and the many Aeolian deposits that we see all across Australia. And I'll also be outlining this video in a more evidence-heavy way, since I saw a few people were skeptical that these were chevrons to begin with. And this skepticism is definitely warranted and necessary. And in this situation, this skepticism came with some positivity, as the necessity to prove myself led to me attempting several solutions inside of the simulator to see if there was any way I could better show and illustrate the damage and chevrons that have been deposited all around Australia. And then I realised that by altering the time of day, the shadows cast by the sun at this angle lead to a highlighting of the chevrons. But not only that, by adding a snow function, I can further highlight the topography. And this has not only led to some incredibly stunning highlights of the chevrons, but it's also allowed me to track the wave damage much further than I originally did in my earlier assessments now that I can better identify features on the land. So now, let's get into it. We kick off here at Cape Bridgewater, in the far western section of Victoria. These massive chevrons appear very clearly on Google Maps, and they stretch much further inland than the sand dunes suggest. A little west of Nelson is the beginning of the South Australian border, so let's cross over. In this part of South Australia, the high cliff faces and sheltering of this area has left little visible damage until we get to the point that was most impacted by the wave here, west of Port Macdonald, around Shally Beach. Massive directional chevrons smashed into this area and went many kilometres inland, depositing large sandy hills in the topographically low terrain. The largest chevrons begin after the visible sandy bits here, and they are quite massive, with them towering above the relatively flat land by 20 metres in some parts. At Kananda, we are treated to an exceptionally large and very long topographical low that displays the beginnings of the mega tsunami. These sandy hills are very impressive, but it's only when we dim the light that we can appreciate their bulbous topographical shadow. This really makes them pop. Notice how these shapes converge. Later on, we'll take a look at the difference between chevrons and aeolian shapes. And by aeolian, I mean wind-formed or wind-influenced deposits. A few comments stated confidently that these were aeolian deposits that I was covering. In this video, I will prove that to not be the case. And it begins by highlighting this joining that is the rule rather than the exception for chevrons. Keep this in mind, because it's important for later on. But it's not just the alteration of the sun that really makes this video different to the other two episodes. Oh no no, it's the addition of the snow layer, because when we apply the snow layer, this happens. Look at the area behind the lake. We can now see the main extent and reach of the wave. The flattening of the land here, by us humans, might have led us to think the wave stopped before this massive lake here, but this is very obviously not the case. Another thing to note with chevrons versus aeolian deposits, as you will see here, is chevrons always have a point at which they stop, which is normally always abrupt. That point being the point when the wave loses its power, dumps its sediment load, and then begins to retreat. As we move on, 
there's an area that really caught my attention at Cowrie Beach, because of the very obvious horizontal lines that humans have excavated. It appears like they've flattened all the chevrons here, because there's no agricultural land. And in between the excavator marks, at places that weren't flattened, we see chevrons that were left behind. I can only assume this was an area that was prone to some pretty bad landslides. But if you live near here, or know or have a theory as to why we've done this, please let me know in the comments down below. Moving on now, and between Beachport and Robe appears very obvious and massive chevron deposits south of Lake St. Clair. This intense amount of wave damage and deposition stretches along this entire coastline, and is unbelievably vast. When this wave hit here, it would have been a truly cataclysmic scene to have witnessed. Now, from Kingston to Gulwa, we have the perfect situation to allow a mega tsunami to grow in height, as it ramped up and struck the shorelines of Long Bay. And strike it did, leaving a massive directional gash in the land from point to point, before suddenly stopping, as Kangaroo Island began to bear the brunt of the main wave as we approach Gulwa, further corroborating the fact that this is a mega tsunami, with areas being spared purely because of the direction these waves are travelling in. On Kangaroo Island, the evidence is clear. If this was an Aeolian deposit, why is the locationing of these impacts perfectly in line with the impact center in the Indian Ocean? And this will be very clear dozens of times in this video. At Porky Flat, obvious wave damage and chevrons occur. I mean, look at this, I can literally draw an outline of the main wave damage here. The waves went beyond this point, but this is the most significant outline, and it is an outline. This is a recent event after all. 5,000 years is a blink in geological time. These deposits become more intense at Seal Bay, where the damage is amplified as you can clearly see here. Breathtaking is one word to describe it. Holy f is another. The carving into the land is just unbelievable. Again, if this were Aeolian, this is not how it'd look. The distribution, shape and scattering is just not right. This is a chevron, and it's a chevron from the mega tsunami that was created during the Burkle Crater impact event. Look at these perfect clear chevron shapes. They are flawless. As we reach the western coastlines of Kangaroo Island, we're greeted by some extremely large chevron shapes. After this mega tsunami scaled a 150 meter high cliff face to get here, where it then deposited chevrons up to around 20 meters high. It followed this river system deep into the land too. Now we get to an interesting part of the story. I originally thought Adelaide was spared from the mega tsunami. Sorry guys, unfortunately it was not. It's amazing to see actually because the wave just managed to hit Adelaide in the southernmost section of it. This again corroborates the fact that these are chevron related deposits coming directly from the Indian Ocean Burkle Crater epicenter, as this is literally just a small strip where the mega tsunami managed to navigate through Kangaroo Island to hit Adelaide. And hit it did. This is actually quite amazing to see. It wasn't so obvious until I altered the lighting and added the snow effect, and it's clear these two have been a game changer in reading the land and the deposits left behind by this event in a very clear and concise manner. It appears like this may be a sand quarry working on the chevron, and the clear cutoff points are here, with the tsunami barely making it through to hit this part of Adelaide. The land that sheltered the rest of Adelaide and bore the main brunt of the rest of the wave is here, and well, take it, it did. As you can see, this mega tsunami absolutely decimated its way through this island, inundating much of it, and leaving these massive visual reminders of the event. Now after this, near Port Victoria, we have some cheeky chevrons that have managed to make it through to strike here, leaving a large imprint of the event behind, which when compared to the surrounding land, bears a striking difference. Now here is a good chance to discuss Aeolian deposits. These thin strips here, all of which are directional based on the prevailing wind current here, were formed by wind and are wind shaped and or formed. Unlike chevrons, the prevailing theme are horizontal lines that do not join. And when deposits like this do appear to join, they are always the exception rather than the rule. Meaning the most predominant shape you will find Aeolian deposits in are these kind of strip like lines, unlike chevrons, which are as the name suggests, chevron shaped. Thistle Island is where we journey to next, and damn, check out this intense directional damage. 
heavy chevron deposits occur in the northern part of the island. Now, this is another time to prove it moment. This is the clear direction the wave was travelling when it hit here, based on the chevrons. This means between this area, there should have been the tiniest, and I mean tiniest section of mega tsunami that made it through to hit the mainland. That would mean Port Victoria isn't the endpoint. But where is? Well, right here. A tiny area north of Port Victoria, where chevrons exist amongst an abundant aeolian fuel background. After this, we move to Lincoln National Park, an area where the bay was enveloped and covered over by large sediment dumps. But that was nothing compared to the area you're probably staring at because it's sticking out like a sore thumb. This region in the west, which has the largest chevrons I've seen in South Australia thus far, with the most wave damage occurring in one location in my opinion. Coffin Bay has some of the most clear and distinct chevrons, and it's even more compelling when it's viewed under low light and with a snow cover applied. The shapes couldn't be more perfect, or more telling. These deposits are screaming mega tsunami in every possible way. As we leave Coffin Bay, we are greeted with the multiple other bays that were impacted as we journey westward evermore. With obvious alterations to the land that you should be an expert at detecting by now, especially if you watched all three episodes. The last piece of major wave related damage occurs here, but let's not stop there because what's hidden is so much more interesting than what is visible, as you can see. And this is the end of South Australia. We now cross over the border into Western Australia and head past Eucla, the first area where the wave related damage begins, over here. It looks like barely anything happened here, but again, what's more interesting isn't what's visible. As you can clearly see, it was still submerged beneath a watery chaos in an instant, and chevron deposition did still occur, just to a lesser scale, with smaller and more numerous chevrons evident. Here, massive chevron deposits exist. The vegetation was plunged not only beneath a vast amount of salt water in a split second when this wave hit, but it was also surrounded by sand, and choked and buried alive by it entirely in some parts, as entire forests became covered over. As we look west, notice the very obvious directional wave damage. Every topographical low here has suffered the same fate. A vast burial by sediment, with large chevrons working their way inland, before finally tapering out at a similar point inland all along the coastlines here. Here at Albany, the giant wave was so high it actually flew over this cliff face over here, which has a topographical high of around 170 metres or 557 feet at the cliff face, where it then deposited huge chevrons here, before largely stopping at the bay's exit, with some finer sediment flows moving ahead of here. But at this point here, at Torndirrup National Park, there was a slightly lower topographical point of around 110 to 130 metres, which allowed a larger proportion of the wave and the sediment it was carrying through, where it then moved over these two islands, with the finest sediment from it being deposited when it made landfall here. How incredible would that have been to witness if you're in a plane flying over here when this wave struck? I mean, like, you know, minus the damage and chaos and all that fun, I mean, boring stuff. After Albany, vegetation growth becomes more intense. This part of Western Australia is very lush, but even a perfect climate that is conducive to plant growth can't hide the scars of this event, with a large section of the island still so damaged from the wave impact that vegetation still hasn't recovered here yet. Massive bulbous chevrons dot this land, and it was actually this region here that took the main impact that otherwise would have struck the area of Albany much harder than it did sparing it from the quite scary fate that occurred to this section of Western Australia. These chevrons are between 30 and 70 metres in size, or 98 to 230 feet. The cliff faces here bear some tremendous looking erosive damage from this impact, with chevrons dotted far inland from this point. Now get ready for it guys, because behind these cliff faces are the massive chevron hills that were deposited by this mega tsunami in the background truly spectacular. Northwest of here we have a similar level of damage, but some pretty large chevrons exist here in the higher areas and we have these more smaller chevron shapes in the lower lying areas. 
From the northwest to the southeast, we have a varying level of topography, from flat land that is 10 or so metres high, before the terrain abruptly rises to a height of between 70 to 90 metres, where it then abruptly rises again here to a height of between 110 to 130 metres. I point this out because it's cool to note the differences in chevron deposition. The most impressive chevrons appear in the highest point, and as we get lower, it appears to get smaller and more numerous, which surprised me. I just thought it was cool to point that out. Unfortunately, much of the land surrounding the town of Denmark has been altered, so the slide that once existed in the topographical low here has been removed. But I imagine it would have been similar to these kinds of slides that we see occurring time and time again in topographical lows all around Australia. Skipping ahead now to the western shorelines past Walpole, we have this major tsunami deposit that has altered the land very dramatically near the area known as Broke. This would have been a lush green forest before this wave struck, and now it's an obvious and ugly scar jutting out upon the still wounded land. Check out those massive chevron hills in the background, they are very dramatic and prominent. A little northwest of here and we have these beautiful chevron formations. Again, note the direction that they are pointing towards. As we begin to move north up the coastline of Western Australia, the direction will change from what it currently is, which is a relatively west to east path at this point, to a direction that points towards the northeast. This can serve as a point of confusion for anyone viewing these structures on Google Maps or Google Earth, as the Aeolian processes that occur in the middle of Western Australia create vertical facing lines. And the chevrons are also somewhat vertical facing as we continue to go north past Perth. I'll point out the differences as we go, but the reason this has occurred is because the earth is spherical, so we have to take that into account. But before we begin to press on, it's worth noting just how far the chevrons here surged inland. Look at this, it's incredible to see. This entire area was absolutely blasted by this impact with the wave taking advantage of some substantial topographical lows of under 20 metres existing here, allowing the tsunami to stream inland with ease. Unfortunately, agricultural clearing and levelling has hidden much of the evidence of this event in the western parts of it, but obviously enough exists to tell us that this was, without a doubt, one heck of a chaotic event, and yet I can't help but wish that I witnessed it. Strange. As we move on, we have massive visible directional sand sediments deposited southwest of Northcliffe, and the impact damage clearly stretches from here towards Augusta. It appears that where we can see these large sandy sediment deposits, we have lower lying land, and we can expect to see chevrons further inland than normal. This appears to be the trend I am seeing. They hint to topographical lows. After this point, we have this region here which is more or less a cliff face from side to side, aside from a few areas where rivers flow out to the sea. This area ranges from 70 metres or 229 feet, all the way up to 190 metres or 623 feet at its highest point. We can see clear chevrons on the topographical highs here, with these ones existing on the highest elevation. When altered, we can see the chevrons that ascended these cliff faces on all points. These massive sandy deposits indicate a topographical low point, where the land begins at 10 metres high, before slowly rising up 160 or so metres. To the left are more fainter chevron deposits, that have been cut through by a meandering river, that actually began its inception into life after this event and after these chevrons were deposited, and many stranded waterways exist on the topographical high points in the area just after these chevrons end. And this has occurred because this has dammed and isolated the former drainage networks, cutting off and stranding the pre-existing waterways. In the far north, bulbous chevron hills exist, predominantly in the more northerly parts. Moving on and just south of Perth, we see the area where this wave damage recommenced. So you can see the directional aspect to this wave very clear and I've pointed it out numerous times in this video. It begins here, moves up to Perth and intensifies as we head north. We covered Perth in episode 1, so I'll just give you a cheeky glimpse into the chevrons here under the new lighting and snow display. This shot is located south of Perth CBD, around a Jandicott area. Here's one more taken in the middle to northern part of Perth CBD. 
Moving north to Gilderton, we're met with another somewhat clear low point. Chevrons stretch inland, and the town itself is basically built inside of these chevrons. The Gilderton Sand Dune tourist attraction are actually just these chevrons. Now, I'm not going to lie guys, I've traced chevrons that are very, very far inland, and I suspect this is from a past event that was, scarily enough, much more intense than this one. I don't care what anyone says, these are not of an Aeolian origin, in my opinion. I see small and large chevrons the same as I would with the Burkle Crater impact around the shorelines, only these are 500 kilometers inland, which is 310 miles. This definitely warrants further study. As for this event, I'd be pretty confident in assuming it went 50 to 100 kilometers or more inland here, and in some places honestly it looks like it went double that. But it's hard to tell, because if there is another impact event that occurred relatively recently, that surged 500 kilometers inland, well yeah, reading this is pretty confusing. The recent, more obvious and larger chevrons here definitely point to the recent event stretching for that distance, but it was definitely not strong enough to produce chevrons that could surge 500 kilometers inland. It was nowhere near strong enough for that. And one can only wonder what horrible, horrible event occurred here at one point in time that spawned a wave many, many kilometers high with the capacity to deposit chevrons so deep inside of Australia. I stopped at 500 kilometers. It kept going. So honestly, instead of just disregarding this, someone really should get out there and take a sample of it. And that's probably gonna be me because I'm genuinely curious as hell to figure out what the fuck happened here. Moving past Gilderton, and we have one of the largest tsunami chevron deposits that I've seen thus far in Australia. Beginning after Brenton Bay and peaking at Wedge, these deposits are both tremendous and terrifying to see. The chevrons themselves are about 70 to 80 meters high. They inundated and altered this once flat landscape in a near instant. This incredible deposition stretches past this point, all the way up to and past Grey. It's amazing to witness these deposits in Western Australia because of how arid it is here and how obvious these shapes are as a result. Soon we will take a look at the Aeolian processes and how they both differ and interact with the chevrons that were deposited by this event. But what you are seeing are pure chevron deposits right now. Look at how far inland these guys go. And it continues beyond this point too, as is clear by the chevron-like shapes on the horizon. Now at this point, we are here. The aridity of the surrounding area will steadily increase from this point on, and the shape of the chevrons here is starting to become increasingly pronounced as a result. Check out how long some of these are. They just streak through the entire landscape, dwarfing it with their appearance. It isn't just long chevrons though. Just a little north of here, hundreds of smaller ones dot the landscape. We're at Lehman now, and this is where things begin to steadily dial up to max intensity. A large section of the land has been flattened out and built upon, which only serves to further highlight the dramatic difference between the giant deposits on the left to the smaller but more numerous ones on the right, as the wave began to push further inland. Very large and impressive chevrons exist beyond this point, the largest that exist in Australia in my opinion. The overall length of some of them is astonishing. The wave was able to just flow over this ancient, highly eroded flat land. Check this out, it's nothing more than Chevron Mountains. The sand from the event poking so evidently through, revealing itself in multiple Chevron hillsides all over the place here. We have yet another two strips leveled by humans, allowing us to once again see just how incredibly hilly this land once was before this excavation was undertaken. At Kalbarri, the river system provided an excellent point of entry for this mega tsunami, which it readily took. The very pronounced chevron shapes show that clearly. To the west, the cliff face rises, and we see duller chevron shapes here as a result. The cliff face here was heavily eroded from this event, and this erosive damage is very pronounced for several kilometers. Check out this awesome chevron slide here yet another topographical low that the sediment slid into after scaling a cliff face and suddenly entering a flat terrain where the sediment just spread out in this beautiful fan-like shape. And finally, we are approaching the end of our journey. This is, in my opinion, the most visibly affected and damaged area in all of Australia, the coastline of Tamala up to Dirk Hartog Island. And you can see why I say that. 
I mean, look at this chaotic hellhole of an area. It's absolutely torn to shreds by erosive forces in some areas, and suffocated by massive chevron deposits in others. The cliff face is so straight too, because of how much it got smashed and pretty much instantly eroded when this mega tsunami hit. It's just the climax of this event in chevron form over here. These cliff faces are around 138 meters at their peak, with elevation slowly declining as we move north. And here we have many chevrons within a giant chevron. Very cool stuff. They are baby chevron. Now we have something very different and very cool. Check this out. What you are looking at here are massive chevrons. Duh. But inside the chevrons are sediments altered by aeolian action. The winds here have worn down the inside parts of these chevrons, and this has occurred as a result of their geographical location, with the westerlies hitting here hard. Aeolian action is the more straight lines, and the chevrons are the lines that meet. This is a perfect example of the difference between the two. There are many Aeolian shapes that can be formed, but chevrons always look different in my experience purely because of the fact that chevrons are directional. They constantly shift their direction based on where they strike due to the fact they are originating from an epicenter and spreading outward. Aeolian processes do not do this. They trend with the direction of the prevailing winds. Eventually, in many thousands of years, these chevrons will be completely worn down, and these Aeolian processes will take over as the dominant feature on the land once more. As we move further north, we begin to exit the area where the wave would have struck. These islands bear clear directional scarring in the bedrock here, and as we progress further north, the chevrons continue, leaving behind very large and distinct shapes. Notice how the direction of these chevrons has changed during the course of the episodes. The angle that it hit Tasmania at differs greatly from the rather upturned angle that it is now hitting this part of Western Australia at, and that is why this confuses so many people and is why they rightfully mistake these chevrons for aeolian deposits. Many, including myself at the beginning, fail to take into account the curvature of the earth when tracking the pathway of the mega tsunami. This is the area around the Cape Range National Park, and we have some really unique and awesome things going on here. Firstly, the video doesn't do it justice, but the chevron deposits at the bottom of the screen are actually at a topographical low, compared to the aeolian looking ones to the north of it. What we are actually seeing here are the almost completely eroded remains of chevrons from this mega tsunami event. The erosion was by Aeolian processes clearly, and the reason this happened is because this entire middle section is at a dramatic topographical high point compared to the surrounding areas. So it has just been slammed by the prevailing winds here for 5,000 years since it was deposited. There are still some clear chevron shapes, but in a few hundred to thousand years these will be completely gone, and eventually the other, more preserved looking chevrons will follow its path and erode too. As we leave this area, we can see how this wave rode up a topographical low point, depositing numerous small chevrons, whereas the section of the wave that impacted the cliff face here had a much different pattern of damage associated with it, and the chevron deposits were more scattered, random, and different in their appearance, with them being more messy compared to the neater deposited chevrons in a lower land. So as you can see, the chevron deposition here is much more dramatic and obvious compared to the lusher parts of Australia. And after this point, the damage suddenly ends. We see nothing else. Aeolian processes take over, and that's what we're going to look at right now. What better way to end this than by showing you guys what an unaffected area of Western Australia looks like, where the prevailing modification placed upon the land is predominantly wind blown. Here's one presentation of it. Notice how they are straight, and if they connect, it's the exception rather than the rule. Their appearance is drastically different to the chevrons we've covered in this series. These ones are curved, yet they look nothing like chevrons. And well, yeah, these are very obviously different. And now, you've seen firsthand the effects that this event left over when it hit Australia. We've gone from Tasmania to Victoria to South Australia and all the way up to Western Australia in excruciating detail, documenting pretty much every noteworthy bit of land along the way. I hope you've enjoyed this journey, I've certainly learned a lot. If you have any idea where those chevron-like shapes that appeared over 500 kilometers inland from Western Australia came from, please let me know. Any possible impact events would be much appreciated. 
In the next episode, we're going to look at the Chevron deposits that I found in Indonesia. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I might actually be the first person to have found and correlated these deposits with this impact event. If not, then all good, but I've found significant evidence and I can't wait to share it with you guys. The next episode is going to be presented in a much more hurried state compared to the Australian series, and we're only going to cover the most prominent and noteworthy sections of the land purely because of the distance we are covering, as I intend on going from Indonesia, west past India, then south down Africa, covering Somalia, Madagascar, and ending our journey in South Africa. Antarctica is the last place you would expect to find evidence of a mega tsunami event. But in this video, I'm going to show you the recent discovery I've made that I truly believe, without a shadow of a doubt, further corroborates the massive evidence that has already been presented in this series. So far, we've covered the undisputable mass of visual evidence left over from the 200 or so odd meter high mega tsunami that was generated by the Burgle Crater impact event 5,000 years ago. We've taken a deep dive into the evidence that exists all over Australia, with a detailed hour-long video that begins with an explanation of what the land looks like after a mega tsunami has torn through it, along with what it has left behind after it has retreated back to the sea, why these depositions are left, and how we can identify them. In this video, I'm going to show you the clear chevrons that exist en masse in Antarctica, which are still visible even 5,000 years after this event occurred. Like always, these chevrons and their direction line up perfectly with the location that the comet struck in a deep section of the Indian Ocean. This evidence only exists in areas that are directly in line with the collision point of the Burkle Crater impact. I will also be showing you guys what an unaffected portion of Antarctica looks like for some comparison so that you can visualize what these areas looked like prior to this mega tsunami crashing into the icy shorelines of Antarctica. Whilst the idea to check out Antarctica did occur to me when I first began this series, I finally got around to it about a week ago, and, well, I was shocked. You can't make this out on Google Earth or Google Maps. This simulator, which uses accurate topographical data, is surprisingly the best tool to use for this event, as you can see here. The fact that these chevrons are so evident is surprising to me. I expected a complete burial of these sediments in this icy landscape, or at the very least, I expected some form of shrouding to occur, and in some places it has, mainly in areas where there are subsurface glacial rivers in flow. Yep, that's right, the rivers still do flow, and Antarctica has quite a large network of them. But in places where flowing water doesn't exist, the evidence is quite clear and staggering. There's little obstacles beyond topography that exist here. No trees to buffer the wave, with a relatively flat landscape to scale. As occurred many times in the Australia series, we see some areas that bore the brunt of the direct wave, which sheltered certain locations from the intense direct hit, whilst others that surrounded it that weren't protected clearly show a marked level of higher intensity, with it also absorbing much of the sediment too, leaving smaller chevron deposits behind in the area that did not absorb the direct impact, with it also absorbing much of the sediment too. So how do we know that this isn't just Aeolian processes? Antarctica does have some pretty strong wind currents that circulate it, and this process of wind-driven erosion, or the shifting or accumulating of sediments, is definitely one of the key players in regards to the shaping and visual features present on Antarctica's surface landscape. Here, we will see a very familiar Aeolian-type pattern. We normally see this type of thing in a desert, and, well, Antarctica is a desert after all a very icy desert. So this is Antarctica as it was before this tsunami hit. You can very clearly see the directional aspect of the chevrons. We have flattened, unaltered, somewhat unremarkable land, dominated by horizontal or vertical windblown formations like this. And then all of a sudden, we have sediment accumulations, clearly left behind by this mega tsunami event. At this point in time, the evidence is kind of seeming very clear to me. I've tracked chevrons in a 360 degree direction from the epicenter of the Burkle Crater impact now. From Tasmania to Indonesia, west to India, then Pakistan, then Iran, before heading south and finding evidence in Oman and Yemen. After this, in Africa's Somalia, the clarity of the impact scales up, before peaking at Madagascar, 
with the largest chevrons occurring there. Evidence then recommences in South Africa, and after this, when we move to the southeast, we now have these ones in Antarctica. This episode was an impromptu release. I'll be finalizing this mega tsunami series in the next episode, where we'll travel from Indonesia all the way down to South Africa. And I hope you are as excited and fascinated over this as I am. This was truly an incredible find for me, and it absolutely blew me away. I'll be releasing a few different videos in the coming days, but the last episode to this mega tsunami series will be out soon, so stay tuned and I hope to see you guys there. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing in the wonder of this discovery with me. Cheers guys! Compelling evidence of the mega tsunami that was generated by the Burkle Crater impact event exists along every major coastline in the Indian Ocean. From Australia to India to the Middle East, Africa and Antarctica, the 200 odd meter high mega tsunami struck every major coastline, altering them in an instant as they scoured their way inland before dropping massive amounts of sediment, retreating and leaving massive depositional hills behind. These hills, known as chevrons, are a typical byproduct of a mega tsunami event. Their existence is owed to the fact that when this comet struck the bottom of the deep Indian Ocean, a massive amount of sediment was thrown up along with the tsunami that was generated. This unimaginable amount of sediment that was strewn with deep sea microfossils was imbued with alien metals as the asteroid's contents fused with the fossils during impact, before being carried away by the massive tidal waves that were generated. This episode is the summary to the series on the mega tsunami that impacted the world 5,000 years ago. I know right, long time coming. Sorry about the delay here guys, I got a bit burnt out on this and I knew that if I forced myself to produce this video earlier, I'd be compromising the quality of it. So I needed a small break away from obsessing over chevrons. But I'm back to conclude this series and to give you guys everything you've been waiting for and more. To briefly touch over what we've already covered in this massive series, at first we began in Australia, and we painstakingly documented the many directional chevrons that existed in the areas that were exposed to the Burkle Crater Mega Tsunami, based on the location of its epicenter in the Indian Ocean. We then covered Antarctica, and some evidence that exists there. In this episode, we'll be beginning in Indonesia, where obvious chevrons exist, before heading westward into Sri Lanka and India after which we'll go to Pakistan and then cover Yemen, Oman, Somalia, Madagascar and end at South Africa. Because of the massive distance that we are covering, only the most prominent evidence will be covered. So without further ado, this is the conclusion to the Burkle Crater Mega Tsunami series. Part 1 Indonesia Indonesia is a dynamic, ever-changing land located in one of the most tectonically active regions on the planet. The volcanism here is one of the most extreme as well, and that poses a dilemma that is somewhat unique to Indonesia, at least in this series. The lack of mega tsunami evidence in Indonesia has led to many doubting the Burkle Crater impact theory, but along with the volcanism, another problem is the tropical climate that exists here, which means vegetation will be hiding much of the evidence. And that's why this simulator has been by far the most incredible tool to reveal these little guys, because of the accurate topographical data that it has. You wouldn't be able to spot the chevrons I'm about to show you on Google Earth or Google Maps, and the snow function just serves to further highlight the typical V-shape seen in mega tsunami chevron deposition events. When the 180 odd meter high mega tsunami finally reached Indonesia, it would have inundated and scoured these tiny, relatively flat islands as it was passing through, leaving little to no deposition behind. But when it finally reached the main group of islands, well, that was a different story. There's a rise in elevation to around 150 meters high. When the 180 meter high mega tsunami smashed into this place, this sharp elevation would have taken much of the force. Meaning when the mega tsunami leaped over it, the drop in power led to a massive drop in sediment being held by the mega tsunami. And do you see it? They begin to be deposited after the waves smashed into the shorelines before dropping most of the material over here, with the direction that corresponds to the epicenter of the impact event. But did the waves stop here or keep going? Let's see. And as you can probably tell, we've got an issue here that we're going to run into time and time again, 
especially when we head to India, which has much of the land reshaped for farming. The chevrons, they're gone. The ground's been leveled, but they're not fully gone. I can see very, very faint outlines. So this is it, you probably think. Nope, look at this. Bam, this was big. Some erosion has occurred to the largest of these with rivers passing through them. And after the main deposits, we have smaller ones that slowly taper off. Once upon a time, this entire coastline would have had chevrons dotted all throughout it before being leveled. Now, as previously mentioned, the issue with Indonesia is deciphering what is tsunami related from what is volcanic. The directional nature of these and their shape tells me that whilst there's an interplay between the two, the vast majority of what you see here is mega tsunami related. But yeah, the lushness of Indonesia is the obstacle that has led to many speculating that chevrons don't exist here. But they definitely do. And this is just one spot. The entire shoreline of Indonesia has this occurrence. But unlike the Australia series, I can't cover every spot or else this will turn into a five hour documentary. So let's move on. Part two, India and Sri Lanka. Beginning in Sri Lanka, the land here is quite low in elevation with much of it being under 15 meters in height. In theory, this means the mega tsunami would have cruised over here, depositing smaller chevrons before finally colliding with this ancient mountain range from a continental abduction event before losing power and dropping the bulk of the sediment. Now let's see if what I just said lines up. And yep, it appears to. Smaller chevrons over here, peaking around here, right at the point where the ancient mountain range begins which is, by the way, taller than the mega tsunami by about 50 meters. And the largest chevrons occur en masse here. On the eastern side of Sri Lanka, where the ancient mountain range doesn't extend to, we see chevrons that made it much further inland. And they are quite numerous and large in size too. We're in India now, and you can probably see the issue right off the bat. Much of the land has been reshaped for farming or for homes. Very little evidence of what was once here remains. Much of it is located on the western side of the southern tip, as the eastern side has almost been completely flattened out by humans. But in general, it received very little impact compared to the western side of India, and probably only had smaller chevrons. But over here, in between the human development, we see some large chevrons popping out. Now, unlike Indonesia, we do not have volcanism interfering with our ability to interpret the land. These are very clear chevrons with a very pronounced V-shape and a direction that correlates to the impact event's epicenter. As you can see, they got stopped short in their ability to go very far inland by these very pronounced mountains. And thus, the wave was forced to head north and to skim along with the direction of the mountain range. These cities that exist here have literally been built on top of the evidence of the mega tsunami, much like Perth in Australia had been. And if we were to follow India north, we would see this evidence all along the shoreline. Part 3. Pakistan Pakistan really got smashed guys, I can't stress this enough. The damage here was so pronounced that it took me a while to actually accept what I was looking at. I mean, look at this. This mountain range is more or less the endpoint of the chevrons, and as we journey back towards the sea, we will see something truly astonishing. This place is so arid, I don't need a snow layer. Yes, these are chevrons, every one of them. They aren't erosion related, they aren't carved out drainage channels. These are chevrons, and as you can see, they end right here. Isn't this absolutely mind blowing? As you can see, parts of it have larger sediment deposits than others, and this has to do with hydrodynamics i.e. how sediment acts when it is suspended in water regarding when it drops out. Kind of like how a river acts during a flood and how the specific gravity of different sediments accumulate in different areas of the river. Along with this, part of it has to do with post-deposition erosion. Man, they are freaking everywhere. They're such a profound size. And as you can probably tell, they look very similar to the shapes that we saw in the most arid parts of Western Australia. And they are all directional. If this doesn't prove the fact that we had a mega tsunami occur in the very recent past, I don't know what will. As we journey inland a bit more, these shapes fade altogether, showing they aren't Aeolian in nature. Look how pronounced the deposition was where it landed here. Truly insane stuff. 
But what makes this even more insane is when we look at Pakistan from a bigger perspective. And doesn't this look familiar? This looks very much like what we saw in the Australian series, when we went over South Australia and Western Australia. What we are seeing here is the extent of the mega tsunami, before it finally lost power and receded. It's carved out the land. It's very obvious and amazing to see. These chevron shapes go further along Pakistan, but we're going to move on to the next incredible sight. Part 4. Oman, Yemen and Somalia We are currently in a location that is quite close to the border between Yemen and Oman. At the moment, we are in Oman, looking at an incredible site of deposition. The mega tsunami rode up and ascended this sloping incline before leaping over the top of this mountain range and depositing the bulk of the sediment that it was carrying, like one would expect, due to the fact that the wave lost much of the power that was driving it when it slammed into this mountain. Massive chevron shapes exist, before just fading into oblivion. As we continue along this range, we see more V-shapes appearing all along it with the most pronounced parts of it being right where the wave lost the bulk majority of the force driving it. Although, to be fair, this city leveled much of the evidence that was once here. As we cross over into Yemen, we're met with much of the same thing. Vast chevron shapes that suddenly taper out at a certain distance. At Somalia, the chevron shapes are a bit more distinct. It bore the brunt of a direct hit to a much higher degree as a result of its relatively flat topography. There was no mountain range to absorb and buffer the impact here, like we had in Yemen and Oman, so we have long chevron shapes that stretch very, very far inland. And yes, this is one big sediment slide. It's unbelievably long, and as you can see, this slide is actually comprised of many, many thousands of chevrons. And the reason this occurred is because sediment slowly dropped out, instead of being forced out all at once, like we see when the mega tsunami waves impact obstructions that are strong enough to take the incredible force that they exert when they slam into it, and thus it slides. This area must have been a pronounced topographical low before it was choked up by these chevrons. It almost looks like a shark fin, and it joins up with the rest of the chevron damage right here. But this is the furthest slide inland to exist in Somalia, with it reaching a little over 140 kilometers inland, absolutely mind-blowing. But when viewed from above, it's even more remarkable. From the slide to the accompanying chevron depositions, in my mind there isn't a shadow of a doubt that this event occurred. But now, we're approaching Madagascar, the site of the largest identified chevron deposition known from this event. Part 5. Madagascar and South Africa If there's one place I wouldn't want to have been when this impact event occurred, it was Madagascar. And the reasoning for this is, well, this. This is truly a site where the land was drastically changed overnight more than anywhere else that we've covered. Now, chevrons exist all along the southern and eastern coastlines of Madagascar. But let's get straight to the good stuff. The most famous group of chevrons is known as the Fenambosi chevron. It's 180 meters high. The same tears that we saw all across Australia occurs alongside it. And these chevrons are very similar to the ones that we just saw in Pakistan. I mean, check out this massive chevron slide. It's exactly the same as the ones that we saw in Western Australia, which is truly remarkable for the fact that the wave had barely lost any of its power by the time it hit Australia. These chevrons contain an abundance of carbonate marine microfossils that have been deposited along strike distances of between 12 to roughly 40 kilometers. These microfossils differ from those that dominate local beach deposits as they are of a deep sea origin and are also fused with alien metals from the meteorite. Many tests have been done and scientists have more or less reached a conclusion that these chevrons are of mega tsunami origin. And now we're approaching our final destination, South Africa. This area is a bit more lush than Madagascar, but you can still see the outlines from it near the shorelines. There's been human interference here, but man, this area was definitely not spared one bit. Chevrons stretch very, very far inland and en masse across the entirety of the South African coastline, stretching from the east to the furthest point down south. Now, this part of Africa is quite flat, so the mega tsunami just pushed its way inland with ease, decimating everything in its way in a matter of seconds. They just keep going and going and going with their direction on point 
in regards to the location of the epicenter and a characteristic V-shape witnessed in every formation. This ain't no Aeolian process guys, this is a mass of chevrons deposited by a major asteroid impact. Truly terrifying stuff to witness. And well, what better way to end this epic journey than to finish right here, at the southernmost point of Africa, where the damage finally ends. This very long gash is one of probably hundreds of points of evidence that I've provided for the Burkle Crater impact event. When a large comet smashed into a deep section of the Indian Ocean some 5,000 years ago, the mega tsunami that was generated absolutely decimated every coastline located within the Indian Ocean. And as you'll see in this video, its level of damage went way beyond that. Discoveries like the one you're going to see in this video never cease to amaze and humble me. And now, here we are in South America, far outside the Indian Ocean. We are literally on the opposite side of the planet. And well, what do we have here? Old mate Chevron, that's who. In this video, we're going to take a look at the enormous damage this mega tsunami caused to the shorelines of South America by examining the vast Chevron depositions that occur across a large stretch of coastal land. So let's take a look at what this mega tsunami did to a continent on the opposite side of the world. To start, because I can't pronounce many of these names and because I can't find their pronunciation online, I'll write the location of each place. This is where we are starting. This was once an epic chevron flow, but it's been flattened to build this city. This will be a recurring theme until we head a little further south when the human interference fades. It's worth noting that Brazil has been one of the only places to have gone out of their way to flatten vast sections of chevron dominated land in order to create farmland or to build houses or cities on. But over here, the backmost part of what was once a major chevron deposit has been flattened to build this city. And all around it, you can see major deposits from this mega tsunami. Further south of this, we have another huge chevron slide. And a little after it, we have land that has been converted to make it hospitable to humans and to make it suitable to build cities on. But this area once looked exactly like the chevron slide nearby to it though. As we leave this island, I wanted to show you the massive excavation works that have taken place here, with these huge semi-circular lines stretched far into the land. Regardless of everything that was done, you can still see the patches of sand popping out amongst the houses that hint to the ancient mega tsunami flow that originally deposited it. And you can see why they undertook this massive task when you approach the coastline and see the remains of what must have been a truly impressive set of sandy hills that stretched very far inland. I have a feeling they stretched all the way up to that impressive mountain range. And I kind of feel like this semi-circular land is set in the scene for some kind of futuristic city to be built on, to be honest. But anyway, we can see the chevrons that tore across here before human interference. And just a little further south from here, we have another set that flowed in before smashing into these giant hills here. We can see a few more chevron deposits further away. And in between here and them, the land has been completely flattened to make way for agriculture or houses. You can still see the tears in the hills from where this tsunami leaped up over them. Truly amazing stuff. The land still hasn't recovered, even though it's been 5,000 years since this event occurred. And look at this little isolated strip of chevrons, dominated by a nearby city that's slowly suffocating it out of existence. As we move on, we can see large strips of coastline that were inundated by the mega tsunami during the event, poking out amongst the brick and mortar of the surrounding city. Some of these deposits are quite impressive, and as you can see, they stretch along the entirety of this coastline. But let's dial the intensity up a notch. We are currently here. From here on out, the damage is going to ramp up considerably. And whilst I suspect that all the regions that we've looked at so far in this video once had the same look to them before humans altered the land, in this part you can see that very little alteration has occurred on the shorelines. But unfortunately, much of the land beyond that has been turned into farmland, so we can only get a glimpse at how incredible these chevrons must have been at one point in time. And you can bet they stretched far inland. Regardless of that, in my opinion, the evidence is damning. 
The fact that this is the only part of South America that has these very intense chevron depositions right at the place where they should occur, that fit perfectly in line to a T with the epicenter of the Burkle Crater impact? Like, come on. And if you've watched the full length documentary we made, link in the description, this situation has never not happened. Like literally in every single place that we have looked at since we started this series, the wave damage has been so damn predictable. And every time it isn't present, literally every time, there's an explanation in the form of some piece of land that blocked the wave. Look at these tiny little chevrons that were spared during excavation, poking their heads out amongst the agricultural land, a truly isolated strip. Now at this point, I kind of feel like the people that live here just said stuff it, let's learn to live with the chevrons instead of flattening them, as all the place is just built within them. Now we are going to look at the most intense depositions, and we'll be travelling here. The largest chevron depositions occur from here on out. We'll start at the boundary between human habitation and land that has been left in the original state. Get ready to have your mind blown. And BAM. Look at that. So yeah, wow. As you can see, this place got hammered. The chevron deposits here are intense. So intense it looks like people left them be and instead still develop the inner part of the land to farm on. So at the point where the chevrons end is where human interference begins. But far out this stretches for hundreds of kilometers down South America from this point on. So yeah, this is what a place looks like after a mega tsunami has passed through. But you want to know the most mind blowing bit? It swallowed this entire landscape whole. See those little chevrons on the opposite end? This was once nothing but chevrons. It's been reclaimed. But want to see something even more mind blowing? If we go over this little stretch, the opposite side has chevrons too. So the mega tsunami kept going after this point and smashed into the mainland as well. The amount of power this wave had in it is absolutely unbelievable. Check out these chevrons poking out amongst farmland. And check this city out, that was built upon a land once dominated by chevrons, with the island right near it still containing the original deposition. And look how far this is stretching inland. Based on some rough estimates, it's looking like these chevrons went between 30 to 60 kilometers inland, depending on whether or not the landscape was mountainous or not. So yeah, I could keep going and going and going and all you will see is nothing but this, all the way down this part of South America. It's safe to say, this is another strong bit of evidence to support the Burkle Crater meteorite impact. It simply doesn't matter how far south I go, this is what we're met with. Eventually South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands get in the way, but to further support what I'm saying, here's a quick look at the chevron deposits in the very far south corner of Buenos Aires. So the Burkle Crater mega tsunami evidence is, in my eyes, beyond irrefutable. Perhaps I'm steeped in bias, but yeah, it appears to me that this series has presented more than enough evidence to convince even the most skeptical. Even though I wasn't planning on doing more chevron based discovery episodes, these massive chevrons in South America were really something quite remarkable to look at. New Zealand is a truly beautiful country. It's serene, peaceful, and more importantly, unlike its mate to the west, it doesn't have any snakes that can turn a nice trip out to the bush into the final thing you'll experience. But deep underneath the ground, chaos runs rampant. Tectonic plates are grinding against one another in the southern island, forming the spectacular southern alps. And in a northern island, an active subduction zone has led to massive volcanism that continuously reshapes the land. The reason I mention this is because New Zealand wasn't spared from the mega tsunami that was generated when a comet slammed into the Indian Ocean 5,000 years ago. But much of the evidence has either been erased or altered. Some parts of it, albeit to a rarer extent than most other countries, do have visible evidence in the form of directional chevrons that have been deposited by the mega tsunami wave after it retreated. But most parts of New Zealand that were in line with the epicenter of the comet impact are very mountainous for the reason I just mentioned. Two continental pieces of crust are currently colliding head on, and the uplift that's being generated here is pronounced. 
Because of this, most of the coastline in the Southern Island is far higher than the 180 to 200 odd meter high mega tsunami wave that struck here. And as a result of this, much of this wave was broken up before it had a chance to wreak the same level of chaos and destruction that we witnessed in every other country we have visited. One thing to keep in mind is that New Zealand is constantly experiencing major earthquakes. These quakes alter the land, and they can do so quite dramatically. So the area where the coastline is today might be different to where it was 5,000 years ago. As a result of this, we only have a few areas to look at in this video. I could do what I've done in the past and painstakingly read the mountains to demonstrate where the chevrons went, and if this is something you'd like to see, please let me know by hitting that like button. But regardless of that, the evidence that is present serves to further bolster the Burkle Crater impact theory, and thus are just as important to study as any other country that was affected by this truly cataclysmic event. There exists only a handful of places where obvious chevron depositions were laid down in New Zealand. Remember, the most pronounced and obvious versions of these depositions only occur in places that are relatively flat and easy to ascend. Whilst chevrons will still be present in places where the wave had to scale mountains, they will be scattered and hard to read. There are many factors to take into consideration when attempting to ascertain the hydrodynamics of the area, so for this reason, we'll take a look at the most obvious and detectable evidence, which will be in places where a river flows out to the sea, or where the land is, for whatever reason, flatter than normal. If we take a look at the Burkle Crater epicenter, over here, you can see that much of New Zealand was in fact in a direct firing line. The wave would have travelled around 8,600 kilometres to reach here, but the rugged mountains of the South Island protected much of the land. When this wave hit, it would have travelled upstream by following rivers and tributaries, but it wouldn't have made it too far, as the elevation here rapidly ascends to a point that renders the mega tsunami at its 200 metre height futile. The first place that we will visit is Stewart Island. Here, Several areas show very clear chevron depositions, that are intense enough to be visible on Google Earth. This is a very compelling bit of evidence, and it's why I'm starting here. These aren't formed by wind, like I've said time and time again in this series, obviously. But here we have clear proof that they aren't, because what we are looking at here is the line of convergence between two parts of the wave, as it swept inland. You can see the sandy chevrons on the top of the island. They crashed into here, then flowed inland, following the topographical low point in between two mountain ranges. It would then sprawl out in all directions, whilst the bulk majority of it continued inland. This wave went all the way through the island and flowed out the other side. This can't be anything other than a tsunami wave, and a big one at that. A little further south, at Doughboy Bay, we see where the tsunami swept in, but it was ultimately prevented from going too far inland by the mountains here. But what did happen was the very clear deposition of chevrons. Which, when compared to the land on either side of it, really show just how foreign this is, as nothing that even remotely resembles this occur in places where the topographical height protected it from the wave and this is probably one of the best places that I have found where this distinction exists. And in the southernmost section of the island, we have what appears to be erosion created by the scouring of bedrock whilst the wave passed over here. This is the only place on the island with these lines. Moving on to mainland New Zealand now, and in the southernmost tip, we find land that has been designated en masse for agriculture meaning much of the chevrons that were here are now completely erased. The only thing that still exists to hint at what once occurred here are these tears in the cliffs along the coastline. But as we move further up, suddenly something pops out. The sandy outcropping in these hills. These are all chevrons. Here's a comparison to show you what the land looked like before the mega tsunami deposited them. Notice just how different the chevrons look compared to the natural features that erosion has carved into the mountains here over time. After this point, the flatland shifts into a mountainous one very abruptly, 
and you can see what I mean regarding the height of the mountains here. They're quite impressive, and you can also see why massive excavation works were undertaken to make the land in the southern tip arable for agriculture, as the Southern Alps dominate this area of New Zealand, and stretch to the northern tip of the South Island. The mega tsunami really didn't have the ability to do much here, impact wise. So yeah, after this point, much of the land has been reshaped by humans or by nature itself. The chevrons are visible on the boundary between the shoreline and the cliff face everywhere, but they fail to scale beyond this. The next actual noteworthy bit of evidence occurs in the northern part of the South Island, beginning with these minor tears here. When we move up, this place is actually the chevrons deposited by the mega tsunami. Notice the direction, it lines up so perfectly with the epicenter of the Burkle Crater. We have another few chevron flows that are exposed to the north of this, and then after that, we reach the area of most destruction, at least for the South Island. This flat bit of land shows us what really happened here, and much like before, the direction so perfectly lines up with the crater. In the North Island, a steep rugged cliff face broke the direct wave here, but they are only around 60 meters high, generally speaking, so the wave definitely still swept inland. But as you can see, agriculture has reshaped the land here, leaving only the faintest evidence behind, such as this place here, with some scarring and sandy outcrops. But yeah, farmland has literally dominated every stretch of land here, and it's no wonder, with the rich fertile volcanic soil being perfect for that purpose. So we need to take into consideration the fact that volcanism continues to reshape the land in the North Island, whether it be directly through lahars and pyroclastic flows, or indirectly through ashfall deposits. As you can see, this river system here, well, it's been slammed by past lahar flows. These aren't mega tsunami deposits, and they don't look like them either. Those would be well underneath this sediment layer. Lake Taupo, the supervolcano that's located on the North Island, has erupted numerous times since this event as well, with a pretty big eruption occurring about 1800 years ago. After this, very little is visible until we reach the northern parts of the North Island, primarily due to agriculture because when we begin to break free from human influence, we see familiar shapes that we've seen in other places around the world, time and time again, albeit with more vegetative growth in certain areas. So after this awesome titanomagnetite mine here, which is a mineral containing oxides of titanium and iron that were deposited by the volcanism here, the evidence begins. And here's the first site. We can see chevrons just north of the plantation here, but just west of it, we see a familiar site. And here it is. The direction of it perfectly corresponding to the epicenter of the crater, much like every other deposit does. I believe this area hasn't had a chance to recover, like the parts to the west of it have, due to its location. But as we move away from it, we see exactly what we saw in South America. Only vegetation has regrown here. Now the vast majority of these are chevrons, and we're back into familiar terrain, with it looking exactly as we'd expect. And here you can see something very cool. The chevrons are on either side here, with a flow that went inland and deposited sediment on this thin strip over here. I wonder what this looked like before it was turned into farmland. It must have been pretty damn epic. It appears the wave swept over this entire stretch of land, with chevrons deposited en masse on the opposite side. There's no mistake in it though, these are chevrons from a tsunami without a doubt. It really hammered this part of the North Island. And here we are at the very tip of the North Island, the place with the most evidence of the mega tsunami. It's swept over from one side to the other, inundating this entire strip of land. The chevrons here are so clear and evident and it's pretty intense to see this, because this same level of damage hit every single location in New Zealand's western facing shorelines. But here, where the land flattens, is where we find the best depositions relating to the Burkle Crater Mega Tsunami. 
And at this point, I think we've finally ended our massive journey. Aside from a few islands here and there, we have truly gone to every single place that was in the direct firing line of the Burkle Comet impact. And we've also looked at areas that were in the indirect firing line as well. At every single location, without fail, we have found chevrons where we'd expect them to be, in the correct orientation and direction, with pronounced tears and scarring in the land. And in some places, clear signs of vegetative damage that still hasn't recovered fully, even to this day, was also seen. This pronounced wave damage is rife stretching from one part of the globe all the way to the very opposite. This event was truly cataclysmic. And now, all that remains is the ability to put the boots on the ground, and to actually go out there and take the samples from these locations, so that we can finally turn this theory into a proven event. Thanks for watching. Many people are quick to dismiss the old stories that our ancestors have passed down for generations. I've never looked at these stories like they were false. I've always viewed the vast majority of them as something that held truth in some shape or form. And in this video, I'm going to cover what more than likely happened 5,000 years ago. That led to the creation of flood stories that are told by over 150 cultures all around the globe, many of whom were isolated from one another. There have been many flood stories told throughout time, but the one that we know of as Noah's Flood is the one we'll be talking about in this video. There's a scientific explanation for what happened, and it's kind of horrifying. If this event were to happen again, I honestly don't know what humanity would do to try and cope with it. It'd be chaos and pandemonium without a doubt, and all civility would be quickly thrown out the window. And I strongly suspect that armed conflict would prevail as society breaks down altogether. So in this video, we're going to look at the global deluge that occurred after the comet that formed the Burkle Crater smashed into a deep section of the Indian Ocean, and how this event led to a seemingly inexhaustible rainstorm that occurred planet-wide and lasted for between several days to weeks without end. The comet that struck Earth 5,000 years ago and created what we today call the Burkle Crater changed society as we know it. Who knows how many ancient civilizations became undone in a matter of hours after it struck, as the coastlines of every single country in the Indian Ocean got smashed by an almost 200 meter high mega tsunami that was generated when this event occurred. The damage that was inflicted definitely had some immediate and devastating consequences. But the rainstorm that followed is arguably one of the worst parts of this event, as not a single place on Earth was spared from it. We created a huge six-part series on the Burkle Crater Mega Tsunami, where we cover every single country located within the Indian Ocean with a shoreline that got affected, and we document the many hundreds of different points of evidence that exist virtually everywhere. You can find a link to that in the description. But the thing is, the comet responsible for this event split into three pieces either when it entered Earth or before it. The largest fragment landed in the Indian Ocean, and the other two landed in two separate places in the Pacific Ocean, where the rain out from these impact centers overlaps, and we see deluge events that are over a week long. The impact event also produced devastating winds, and the event itself was dated to have occurred around 2807 BC. Many cultures speak of hurricane force winds, water falling at the rate of more than a metre over the course of a few days, and all of these stories have a central theme that revolves around most of the population dying out, with very few survivors existing after the disaster had finally concluded. But how could this happen? Well, when all three fragments of this comet made contact with the ocean, seawater was vaporised en masse to an insane degree. Millions of tonnes of water got volatilized and turned into a gaseous state in an instant when contact was made. It would take days to cool this vaporized seawater, and during that time, the winds generated by these three impacts, along with the normal trade winds that Earth experiences, would spread these clouds of vapor all around the world. And when it finally cooled, well, it would ultimately fall. And fall it did. On its own, the Burkle Crater vaporized enough seawater to cover every inch of the globe. But when it's combined with the two impact events that fell in the northern and southern part of the Pacific Ocean, well, 
you can see where I'm going with this. But on top of that, many scientists that are researching this impact event also hypothesize that there might have been some effects produced that caused severe atmospheric disturbances, producing rainfall effects that were multiples of the overall amount of water vaporized by the impact. Many of the stories that speak about this event tell about how torrential rainfall and hurricane force winds devastated entire forests and inundated valleys and plains. These stories also talk about how there was no cessation in the event. Several hundred deluge myths are recorded, and they all talk about the same thing, pretty much, with many of them also containing descriptions of the mega tsunami and the heated re-entry ejecta that occurred when the material that was catapulted into space by the comet eventually fell back down to Earth. It's more or less certain that the great majority of these myths represent a single event or a simultaneous set of events. On top of this, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are something that we haven't even discussed in the series. But it's likely this impact triggered many of them, so who knows what interplay the volcanism had on the climate too. But with all of this being said, I've been doing a bit of extra research, and I honestly think the Noah's Flood story might be more strongly associated with the mega tsunami than with the deluge, and I'll explain my reasoning for this in a different video because I want to explore this subject deeper. But so far, what I've found is kind of mind-blowing, at least it is to me, assuming it's correct of course. And on top of this, a commenter told me to check out South America and see if I could find anything there. And my mind was a bit blown by what I saw, and I'm probably gonna make an episode on this too. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of this, and hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. So it looks like we need to stop being so headstrong. I see a lot of scientists that are so caught up in their ways that they've lost the ability to keep an open mind and I see many others who never had that ability to begin with. Science stops becoming science when ego gets in the way. And this is worth noting, because many are quick to shrug off the stories that literally generation after generation told for thousands of years. Humans from the past aren't different to humans today. There was a reason we had those stories to begin with. And when hundreds of cultures from completely separate parts of the world have the same story from the same time, we should probably listen and consider it worthwhile to investigate. Thanks for watching. The other day, I was finishing up a script for the final episode in the Burkle Crater Impact series. Well, it was supposed to be the final episode before I discovered more chevrons in South America and New Zealand. But I digress. I was studying up on a research paper that I'd already read through months prior before I started the series but I was refreshing my knowledge on how the global deluge that followed this event took place. As I was going through all of this, and looking at the math regarding how much water was vaporized, suddenly the idea occurred in my head that it seemed far more likely that the story of Noah's Flood started with the mega tsunami and followed afterwards with the global deluge. Originally, I thought it was impossible for the mega tsunami to have made it up as far as Iraq, which back then was known as Mesopotamia, but that's changed. Why? Because when I first started this series, I didn't have the same level of knowledge that I have now, with a lot of it coming to me as a result of making the series to begin with. Because, as you already know, we literally went to every single major place in the Indian Ocean to find evidence. So my understanding of these events and what to look for has increased tenfold. In this video, I'm going to take you through some stuff that I find to be pretty damn mind-blowing. This is just a theory, I could be wrong, but if I'm right, then this might just be the missing piece to the puzzle of that story. When I first looked at the possibility of the mega tsunami reaching Iraq, I immediately speculated it to either be impossible or for the waves to be lackluster by the time it approached it. What I was missing back then when I'd come to that conclusion was a few key pieces of knowledge. If you watched the final episode in this series, you'd know what happened to Pakistan, it has some of the most intense chevrons I've ever seen. Well, to the west of it, something different happened. You see, when the mega tsunami approached this point here, at the Gulf of Oman, two things happened. The first was the ramp up height of the tsunami grew, due to it having to narrow in to enter the Gulf. The second was that it had very little option regarding where to go. It was bounded by very high cliff faces on both sides of the Gulf. And this is bad because if it can't scale these mountains and lose power, then it's going to hug them and follow along with them. And what does this lead to? Bad times for all. Take this place, for example, in Oman. This area is about one kilometer higher than the sea level. The lowest point is around 400 meters. 
This tsunami was 180 meters, maybe 200 meters at most. Now, when this mega tsunami first entered the Gulf of Oman and smashed into the cliff faces on both sides, it definitely would have lost some power. But it's unclear to me if this diminishment in force was enough to drastically lower the overall height of the tsunami or not. I'd assume it would though, to some extent. One piece of knowledge that I was missing when I came to that conclusion that I mentioned earlier was how the tsunami wave would act when funneled. The second was how much force remains within it after it collides with an obstruction strong enough to take it. Alright, so here is where it rips into Oman. Very obvious chevrons. Let's follow it now. Heading over the ocean towards Iran, here is the furthest extent the wave reached for the direct impact, which has mountains over here that are about 300 meters high at their lowest, and they stretch above 1.7 kilometers. And here's evidence of the impact now in chevron form. And here is where the mountain blocked the wave from penetrating deeper into Iran, leaving it no other option than to skirt along with the mountains of Iran, depositing thousands upon thousands of smaller chevrons as it slowly lost force the more it traveled. And as that occurred, sediment began to drop out. To the west, we have this place, I think it's pronounced Kassab. The mountainous cliffs here are 1.5 kilometers high, meaning they also acted to block the tsunami wave. Now I know what some people are thinking, these are Aeolian deposits. Well I've compared them to sites just a little away which are definitely Aeolian deposits and they look nothing like them. So these chevrons, they're facing a very specific direction, towards Iraq. Now I've looked at many of the other surrounding countries such as the UAE, Qatar and Bahrain and I'm seeing the same chevron type shapes. They're smaller, more numerous, and were likely deposited by a smaller, weaker version of the original mega tsunami. These countries are all places where the elevation is low enough for it to be rapidly covered on mass, with many of these places only 30 meters above sea level. But to save time, I'm going to focus primarily on Iraq in this video. If you'd like for me to make a separate episode on these, please let me know by hitting that like button. When we reach Iraq, well, the topographical height here doesn't really reach above 20 meters like ever. I went 400 kilometers inland and still barely a scratch over 20 meters. Then I did a topographical scan from the sea all the way to Baghdad, 600 kilometers away, and it barely got over 40 meters. This is telling, because here's the thing guys, the chevrons that we covered in a documentary series were all deposited by the direct impact, meaning they're the most distinct, largest and obvious forms of the deposition left over by the tsunami. But what happens when the direct impact has already occurred? The only obstacle this wave really had was the massive mountain range in Iran. After that, barely any obstacles existed. What's terrifying is that the wave, which as you know, was around 180 meters before, needed to only be 50 meters in height to completely submerge the entirety of what was ancient Mesopotamia beneath between 20 to 30 meters of water. So this flood story, in my eyes, is legitimate. This area looks to have been completely inundated, and the landscape itself has small chevron shapes that do not look Aeolian in their nature, at least they don't to me. In Iraq itself, we have tens of thousands of small V-shapes all throughout the land. These shapes stretch very far in, and I do believe that they are of a mega tsunami origin, and that they aren't a normal Aeolian process. And I suspect the tsunami followed the pathway that the ancient Tigris and Euphrates River follows, decimating every single ancient settlement it came across and taking hundreds of thousands or even millions of lives in the process. Another thing that corresponds with the story is the fact it's often said that the Ark itself landed in Mount Ararat in Turkey, which also lines up with the direction this mega tsunami was traveling guys. So yeah, there's a few holes in this theory that still need patching up, such as the fact that the area around Turkey is quite mountainous. But the craziest part to me is the fact that 800 kilometers of Iraq is nothing but flat land, giving this mega tsunami free reign to go as far as it wanted and to cause as much chaos as possible. So in present day, I think very little visual evidence can be seen because it wasn't a direct wave impacting it. It was a weaker secondary version of it, depositing smaller chevrons, but still stretching very far inland due to the low topographical height along with the other reasons I gave you. In the episode where we traveled to Somalia, we saw that slide that stretched 160 kilometers inland and that wasn't even in a bay or in an area where the mega tsunami needed to funnel itself to enter an area. 
So if this mega tsunami was funneled when it entered the Gulf of Oman, and if it was trapped and had nowhere else to go aside from further inland, why wouldn't it go further? Another thing worth mentioning is the fact that this might have also happened to the Gulf of Aden off Yemen, leading to this mega tsunami possibly travelling up the Red Sea and possibly affecting Egypt's Cairo in the process. Now Cairo was known for recording this story, so I see no reason why that couldn't have happened either. So what do you think about this guys? Do you think the theory I just mentioned was feasible or a complete flop? Let me know in the comments down below. As always, thank you so much for watching and supporting this channel, and I'll see you all real soon with another video. Cheers guys.